Hi friends, welcome back. Today we will be covering the fourth lecturer on social security in India. And today we will be covering the Employee Provident Funds Act. Okay, and there are many other miscellaneous provisions act that have been provided. We will be covering it in other lecturers. But today the intention is to cover the Employee Provident Fund Scheme Act 1952. And it is one of the important act for the examination point of view. See, the Employees Provident Funds and Miscellaneous Provisions Act 1952 is enacted to provide a kind of social security. In the previous classes, we have seen what is the definition of social security and what exactly is social security. You can watch the previous videos so that you can get a complete idea. The act mainly provides retirement or old age benefits such as provident fund, superannuation pension, invalidation pension, family pension and deposits like insurance. The act provides for the payment of terminal benefits in various contingencies that mean in various risks on in or in various emergencies such as retrenchment, closure, retirement or reaching the age of superannuation, voluntary retirement and retirement due to incapacity to work. The next point is important. Four schemes are framed by under the Act. There are four schemes under this Act. First one is Employee Provident Fund Scheme 1952. We will be seeing this Act today. The second Act is Employee Family Pension Scheme 1971. Third, Employees Deposit Linked Insurance Scheme 1976 and Employees Pension Scheme 1995. The Employees Provident Fund and Miscellaneous Provisions Act of 1952 applies to the whole India except Jammu and Kashmir. But, okay, Employees Provident Fund and Miscellaneous Act of 1952 applies to the whole India except Jammu and Kashmir. As Jammu JNK has been removed with special provisions, now this act may be applicable to Jammu and Kashmir. Please do check or verify this. Okay. Next, now we will see where all does this application or these acts will be applicable. Employees Provident Fund and Miscellaneous Provisions Act of 1952 is applicable to every establishment in which 20 or more are employed. That means if at all you are running a factory and there are more than 20 employees, more than 20 employees those are working for you, then this act will be applicable for that organization. Next. Second, every establishment which is engaged in any one or more of the industries specified in Schedule 1 of the Act. The industries which have been specified in Schedule 1 of the Act of Employees Provision Fund Act of 1952, for those establishments this Act will be applicable. For example, in Schedule 1 there is, there are many industries one of those example is a steel manufacturing industries where there are more than 20 employees employed okay then the act will be applicable over that organization then third any establishment notified by the central government if at all i have an organization and central government has mentioned i have taken under taken it under the government of india okay and now it has become psu Okay, so this is the establishment that is notified by the central government and therefore this will come under the Employee Provident Fund Act of 1952. Before going to see the provisions of the Act, we will see some of the basic terms that are important for the understand this Act. <coughs> what are basic wages? First we will see what is basic wage. Basic wages means all emoluments which are earned by an employee while on duty or on leave or on holidays. That means even if he is working or if he is on leave or he is on holiday. Okay. Leave is for one day. Holiday is for more than one day. Okay. If he is on holiday, then the basic wage will cover all the payment that is done for the employee on these days okay 
C. Basic wages means all emoluments which are earned by an employee while on duty or on leave or on holidays with wages in either case in accordance with the terms of contract of employee and which are paid or payable in cash to him but does not include. This is important. Basic wage does not include the cash value of any food concessions. For example, in many of the mechanical companies, an employee is provided with the food. Okay free of cost but this food concession this food concession that means it has been provided free in some of some of the organizations it will be provided for if at all the rate is 100 rupees he will it will be provided for 20 rupees but this 20 rupees is not added in this basic wages okay therefore the cash value of any food concession is not allowed in basic wages then second what is not allowed any dearness allowance what is da it is dearance allowance okay it is the wage that is adjusted to the inflation what is inflation it is nothing but rate of increase of the food products okay or rate of increase in the products in the market okay the da is nothing but it is the amount that is adjusted to the inflation in order to survive for the employee any dearance allowance that is say all cash payments by whatever name called paid to the employee on account of rise in the cost of living house rent allowance overtime allowance bonus commission or any other similar allowance payable to the employee in respect of his employment of work done in such employment okay such all the factors are not added in basic wages then third any present made by the employer that is if at all in Diwali in Diwali employee gets a bonus gift that is gift card from Amazon from the employer then it is not added in basic wages now we will see the first act that need to be covered in this lecturer that is employees provident fund scheme of 1952 this is very important act for the examination point of view so do Carefully read these provisions. The PDF will be provided in the telegram channel. Do join the telegram channel. The link is provided in description. Now we will see what are the provisions of this employee provident fund scheme of 1952. Employee provident fund is the main scheme under the employees provident funds and miscellaneous provisions act of 1952. This is one of the act that has provided or covered by employee provident funds and miscellaneous provisions act of 1952 the scheme is managed under aegis of employee provident fund organization that is employee provident fund scheme this is under the aegis of epfo okay it is managed by employee provident fund organization next under employee provident fund scheme an employee has to pay a certain contribution towards the scheme and an equal contribution is paid by the employer we can understand this with an example okay just imagine you have hired me for a work okay you are the boss that means you are employer and i am employee okay now in this EPF, that is Employee Provident Fund, you should also contribute 12% and I should also compulsorily contribute 12%. Okay. And this is mentioned in the Act. The employee gets a lump sum amount including self and employee's contribution with interest on both on retirement. That means after the retirement, that is after the age of 58, I can withdraw this whole amount that has been credited to the employee provident fund one that you have credited and the other that I have credited so I will get both the amount at the age of 58 next there are some compulsory conditions that have been mentioned employees drawing less than 15,000 that means if at all I have a salary less than 15,000 per month I have to mandatorily become the member of EPF I should be I should compulsory become the member of EPF. Employee who whose pay is more than 15,000 a month at the time of joining is not eligible and is called non-eligible employee. Okay, it is very simple. If at all my salary is more than 15,000, I can manage to 
help myself with my retirement life but if at all i have less than 15000 i can't manage even my basic things so what government will do you are compulsory beneficiary that means you should compulsorily mandatorily become a member of epf and you need to save the money for your future but whereas if at all i am drawing more than 15000 then i am not eligible to join this epf but there is also a provision if at all you have you are earning more than 15000 with the permission of assistant pf commissioner with the permission of assistant pf commissioner and if he agrees then i can be a member i can be a member of epf this is the provision now we will see what will be the contribution of employee and employer contribution of employer and employee the contribution paid by the employer is 12% of the basic wages we have seen what is basic wages okay plus dearness allowance plus retaining allowance all this included he will pay 12% on that amount that means he will pay basic plus dearness allowance plus retaining allowance what is retaining allowance see you have employed me you will see that with money problem i will not leave your company so you will provide some of the allowance for me in order to increase my income and this allowance is nothing but retainance allowance okay now what employer will pay 12% of basic plus dearness allowance plus retainance allowance on this 12% he will contribute to the epf fine this is the employer contribution just a minute okay this is the employer contribution then an equal contribution is payable by the employee also that means what amount is paid by the employer is also need to be paid by me okay see there are some differences here we will try to understand it if at all my salary is 10000 10k okay employer need to pay 12% of this okay because this includes da as well as retainance allowance okay what will be 12% of this it will be nothing but 1200 and i need to pay 1200 okay but if at all my salary by basic wage is 10000 okay and my total salary including all different different allowances house rent allowance and all my salary is 12000 okay but my employer will pay only 12% of 10k that is 1200 i will pay 1200 but i can increase this 1200 to 1400 also because it is my wish but the employer will keep it stable 1200 he may also increase from 12% to more but it depends upon the employer but it is compulsory for him to pay 12% minimum fine hope you understood if you if it told you are new to the channel please do subscribe the channel and you can watch the previous videos that are provided in the playlist of the youtube channel okay next in the case of establishment we will see the next points in the case of the establishments with the establishments which employ less than 20 employers or meet certain other conditions as notified by epfo the contribution rate of both employee and employer is limited to 10% this is important in the case of establishments which employs less than 20 employees or meet certain other conditions as notified by epfo the contribution rate to both employee and the employer is limited to 10% that means only 10% above it is 12% but here it is 10% for most of the private sector it's for most of the private sector it's the basic salary on which the contribution is calculated it is the basic salary on which contribution is calculated for example if monthly basic salary is 30000 the employee contribution towards his or her epf would be 3600 that is 12% of the basic pay while the equal amount is contributed by the employer each month this is the same as the example that we have discussed earlier of 
it should however be noted that not all of the employer share move into the epf kitty that means whatever share has been provided by the employer it will not move completely to the epf out of the employee contribution 8.33% will be diverted to employees pension scheme but it is calculated on rupees 15000 okay this is important 8.33% will be diverted to employees pension scheme and it is calculated on rupees 15000 because 15000 is the less or is equal to or less than amount that should be required in order to enroll in epf scheme right hope you can understand epf scheme so 8.33% will move to the employees pension scheme next see as we have told as being an employer you are employer and i am employee okay i may voluntarily contribute more but here there is a condition higher voluntary contribution by the employee or voluntary provident fund what is it we will try to understand the employee can voluntarily pay higher contribution above the statutory rate of 12% of basic pay this is called contribution towards voluntary provident fund this is not contribution towards the provident fund it is contribution towards the voluntary provident fund which is accounted separately which is accounted separately that means it is calculated separately this voluntary provident fund also earns tax free interest it will earns tax free interest however the employer does not have to match such voluntary contributions okay we have seen an example that i will pay 1400 rupees to my pf but the employer will pay only 1200 there is no compulsory that he should match to the contribution that i am making okay next we will see when can we withdraw this epf amount okay i have deposited amount and it is for contingency is there any provision that i can remove the amount yes we will see it according to the epf act for claiming final pf settlement one has to retire from the service he has to retire from the service then only he can remove the amount okay after attaining 55 years of age after attaining 55 years if it has got retirement then he can remove the amount okay but it is not 55 i think it is 58 58 years not 55 years it is just a mistake it is 58 years next the total epf balance includes the employee's contribution and that of the employer along with the accrued interest that means collected interest collected interest okay this can be withdrawn see at the age of 58 that is retirement you can withdraw 100% of amount okay 100% but at the age of 57 itself at the age of 57 you can withdraw 90% of amount from your epf and that is called partial withdrawal let's we can see partial withdrawal a person is eligible to withdraw money in advance from their pf account for purposes like okay if at all there is emergency you can withdraw the amount for marriage for education for medical treatment etc subjected to the prescribed condition there are some conditions note that the said advance is totally tax free and interest free this is very important epf amount is totally tax free as well as interest free there is however a window to partially withdraw the amount of these earnings nearing to retirement anyone over 50 this is not 54 it is 57 can withdraw 90% of the accumulated balance with the interest okay 58 you can withdraw 100% but at 57 plus 57 and above you can withdraw 90% with effect from december 6 2018 from december this is current affairs with effect from december 6 2018 the employees can withdraw 75% of the epf corpus after remaining unemployed for one month and balance 25% he is out of employment for 60 straight days or more this is very important and very easy to understand 
from 2018 onwards the employee can withdraw 75% of the epf corpus after he has been fired from the job for one month okay and within one month he is unable to find any of the job then he can withdraw 75% of the amount and if at all he is unemployed for more than 6 months sorry more than 60 days that is 2 mo- 2 months then he can withdraw the extra 25% also that means he can withdraw 100% what are the interest on the account the interest rate of every month is 8.65% which may differ every year interest rate is calculated every month but it is deposited in the account at the end of financial year this is very important interest rate is calculated every month but it is deposited at the end of financial year so this was the first tag that we have covered do watch these videos again and again because it is important to revise the pdf will be provided in telegram channel do join the telegram channel the link is provided in description if at all you are new to this channel do subscribe the channel and press the bell icon for notifications in the further sessions we will be, we will be dealing with employees pension scheme 1995u and some of the miscellaneous schemes thanks for watching the video stay tuned